All right, ready? If you click on participants, the bottom um, the column will come up. There we go. Okay. The attendees. Yeah. So we got four, five. Hello, people. Welcome, welcome. We open it up a little bit early to make sure everybody gets in and ready for our exciting programs today. Let's see here. There was something I was going to do. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> it has been raining all over Virginia. Yay, we're excited for the program too. Thank you, Adrian. Yes. <laughs> Let me fix my name so I'm not just Stratford Hall. I mean, I could change my name, but that's kind of weird. Let me do that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. <clears throat> I feel like I should uh, be playing music or something, or I don't know, no, a clip from Indiana Jones or something. Yeah, there we go. We're talking about archaeology. Or Laura Cro yeah, Croft or whatever her name is. <laughs> yeah, Tomb Raider. There we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not quite as exciting at Stratford, but sort of. I mean, I think it is. It can be. <laughs> exciting in a different way. Exactly. I, I have never um, had a, a large ball chase me down a <laughs> yeah. or anything. So. Probably make that happen. I feel maybe down to the we could get a big ball the top of the cliffs and roll it down the road to the beach. We, we could do pretend. we could do our Stratford Hall like Indiana Jones parodies. Yes, like, recreate. Yeah, this can happen. This is gonna yeah. happen. It'll be amazing. Hello, everyone. We're going to give everybody about to 1102 or so before we kick this off today. And uh, yeah, I'll introduce my wonderful co-host today. You are bombarded by Kelly's on this Saturday morning. I know everyone's like, that's not John. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Yeah, John fixed his hair. <laughs> A little different. Welcome, everyone. So yeah, in about two minutes, we'll start So go fill up your coffee or get some popcorn or whatever it is that you need to do. Excited here. <clears throat> Sounds good. I like that idea. Yeah, right. The popcorn's great. Big, big popcorn fan. Kelly's drinking out of her Batman cup. I have my coffee in my glass that I got in Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm a big fan of pint glasses for coffee. Like why bother going back to get a refill when you can put your two cups in a pint glass? That's my philosophy. The bigger the mug, the better. Exactly, exactly. All right, one minute till countdown, everyone. Thank you for Zooming in with us on this Saturday morning. It has been pouring um, at Stratford at, in Lynchburg where I live and Kelly what was the weather like yesterday before we get started uh saw the crazy <laughs> just absolutely insane I think we've gotten a total of six or seven inches of rain in the past like two days um so I saw just, some pictures of it flooding on parts of the site too it was quite wild it it was so um we look like we have swimming pools all over the place <laughs> Well, happy that was fixed. All right, it is 11.02. Welcome everyone to Science Saturday, the second Saturday of the month at Stratford Hall. It's a lot of S's. <laughs> S's. Um, I am Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz. I'm the Director of Programming, Education, and Visitor Engagement. I am also a professional archaeologist. I have a PhD in African Diaspora Studies from UC Berkeley. Um, my second field at UC Berkeley was in anthropology, specific, specifically, um, so I can speak this morning, specifically in historical archaeology. And I have excavated sites all over Virginia, including Jamestown, which was one of my first places I've ever worked as an archaeologist. And I also worked in California for years as well, working on a lot of mission sites and some really cool stuff. Yes, I have a PhD. Yep, I'm a FUD. That's me. 
so yes, Max, I have a PhD. I am Dr. Dietz. My father, funny enough, before we get kicked off here, it's very relevant for today's topic. My father was Dr. James Fonto Dietz, and he is considered the forefather of historical archaeology. So archaeology is literally in my DNA. And I'll tell you a funny story before we kick off. And I was thinking, I was like, should I tell the story or not? It's pretty funny. So my father, when he was a little boy, he grew up in Cumberland, Maryland, um, up in the, you know, in Appalachia and Western, far Western Maryland. And he grew up in the house that his great grandfather built. He was a Union soldier and used the money from his time serving the Union Army to build a little sort of shotgun style house in the mountains. And that's the house that my father grew up in. And there was no indoor plumbing. And so as a little boy, maybe seven or eight years old, my father heard that there was gold buried in the outhouse outside. So him and his cousin Bob went out there and climbed down into the outhouse, right, um, in search of gold. And the funniest part of the story is, well, one, there was no gold in there. But two, his, his most vivid memory of this moment when he decided that he wanted to be an archaeologist is when he looked up. And there was a halo of light coming in from the light around him that was seeping in through the walls of the outhouse. And his mother was like, Jenny! <laughs> Anyways, I think it's funny. I hope at least one of you laughed. I think it's hilarious. But that was the beginning I've of never heard that story. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Pretty great. That was the beginning of his love of archaeology, and he passed that down to several of his kids, including myself. And I have to say that Stratford has one of the coolest archaeological collections I've ever seen, and we are just starting to break the surface of what we have. And I am joined here today not by John Bachman, the king of paleontology and of dinosaurs. I am here today with my right hand and all these cool education archaeology things. I'm Kelly Childress, so I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. Wow. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Childress. I'm the manager of interpretation here at Stratford Hall. Um, and I have a background in history from Lynchburg College in Lynchburg, Virginia. I have also done some archaeology um, at a 19th century kitchen site. Of course, not as much as Kelly has. Um, and I deal with a lot of museum education and interpretation here on site. So I'm very happy to be here and excited to hear all your questions today. And what's exciting about today's program, so this, I want to do more of these archaeology programs, because like I said a moment ago, so there's been archaeology at Stratford for, oh my goodness, almost 50 years. And the majority of the archaeology that has been done there, all the artifacts have been put on a shelf. So we have decades of archaeological analysis, washing, lab work, interpretation to do. And that's part of the excitement, I think, of what Kelly and I are going to be sort of moving forward with. Um, but we're going to be bringing some of the cool things that we're finding on the shelves, finding in collections to these kinds of programs. So today's introduction to archaeology is really the nuts and bolts to get you guys thinking about what archaeology is. So Kelly, in all of her brilliance, has, has um, started this archaeology school program module and we're going to sort of test it out on all of you in a way and just sort of uh, in terms of looking at the slides and some basic introductory facts and things like that so we're going to introduce you all to what is archaeology and then we're going to talk about some of our favorite things so you ready for the the show here kelly i am okay She's going to share a screen. It's going to be nice. say, I need authorization to share my screen. <laughs> that would help. <laughs> I'm like, get it together, Kellys. What are you doing? All right. Make you a co-host. Sorry about that. Authorized. All right. There we go. All right, so this is going to be a back and forth between Kelly and I, and then we'll open it up for questions. So hit it, lady. <laughs> All right, so Science Saturday, Archaeology at Stratford Hall. And there is our site. Now, Kelly, do you want to give them a rundown about uh, Stratford Hall? Yeah, a really quick sort of, uh, I don't know, fortune cookie elevator ride sort of introduction to Stratford Hall if you don't already know and love it. Stratford Hall was um, established in 1738 by a Mr. Thomas Lee and his wife, Hannah Ludwell Lee. It was built by enslaved laborers um, from West and Central Africa, specifically Senegambia, Ghana, and the island of St. Helena as well as some enslaved African-Americans. And it was home to four generations of the Lees and hundreds of 
enslaved African Americans. And this site is on the banks of the Potomac River. It is about what, 2000 acres now, just under. And it is one of the examples, the house itself is one of the most sort of prominent examples of Georgian architecture in the colonies. I think that's good. Anything else you wanna to add to that? Oh, and that right there is the kitchen my favorite building on site. And then over here, we got the Southwest Dependency, et cetera. But we'll, we'll do other talks on those buildings later in time. No, I think that about sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is archeology? span Archeology is the scientific excavation and study of the past through the material culture that people have left behind. Okay, so do you wanna elaborate on that, Kelly, and kind of put it into something that we'll all, you know, understand? <laughs> yeah, I love whenever I teach courses on archeology span or public lectures, you know, it's important to give that real strong definition. We're gonna be doing a lot of those textbook definitions today, but I'm also gonna translate it to basically saying, we're studying people's garbage. We're studying things that were tossed, thrown away from, from eras past, from people. And it's a way to sort of understand past cultures and history through literally the garbage that's found in the ground. And, you know, I like to call it sometimes garbology. It's quite fun digging through people's old trash. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and those right. pipes are fantastic. Go ahead, sorry. Did you want to talk about the pipes? Yeah, sure. So those okay. pipes, for those of you that are like, I've either seen those or what are those? These are parts of a pipe, pipe bowls that were excavated in the 1970s from Dr. Fraser Nyman, who is now the head of archaeology at Monticello. And he and his team in the 1970s excavated the Cliffs Plantation, which was the 1640s and 50s plantation on the side of Stratford. That was the um, sort of excuse me, the settlement before Stratford Hall was established. These pipes right here <clears throat> were very likely made on site by enslaved Africans. And if you can see the designs that were marked in there, um, you have representations of different sort of ethnic marks in West Africa. And you also see this kind of sort of homemade um, pottery throughout the African diaspora throughout the American South, where a lot of enslaved folks um, out of necessity would take local clay, make things like pots and, and dishes and pipes and things like that to supplement what they had. And these are some of my favorite objects. These are actually, this picture in particular is in the uh, National Geographic History Magazine article on 1619 that I wrote in 2019. So if you want to see a picture of this in glossy print, um, I definitely was able to squeeze that into my article and give Stratford a nod. Thank you. Okay, so what is material culture? Material culture refers to all of the objects that were made, used, and kept by past and present civilizations. And I'll take it from here. Material culture is stuff. It's the tangible representations of your culture. It is everything from the cup that we're drinking out of. You want to raise your Batman cup there. Um, it's the clothes that we wear. It's the chair that we sit in. It's everything that has been built by humans or used by humans that represents their culture. And I think material culture studies in particular is one of the most interesting things to study. And it really helps shed light on a lot of people's histories that aren't written in books. Absolutely. Okay, so what are artifacts? Because we deal with these a lot. <laughs> an artifact is an object or any object that was made, modified, or used by a human being. Yep. So for example, I love using this. A rock that's just sitting outside is a rock. A rock that was taken and carved or chipped is an artifact. So as soon as a human modifies something, puts their print on it, makes it different, um, creates it, it becomes an artifact. And artifacts are the bread and butter of archaeological sort of research and study. Okay, so what is a site? What is this site? <laughs> What is this site? This right here is the oval site. So when I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk, when I was giving you that really quick introduction to Stratford Hall, and I talked about those first um, enslaved Africans, the 70 enslaved Africans that were brought here from Senegambia, Ghana, and St. Helena Island, they were brought here to build the great house. Um, they set up a temporary living quarter that they lived in 
um, and worked in and around for the whole period of construction of the house. So I think that's at least 10 years. I'm not even sure we know exactly how long it took to get that house from the first brick up to the sort of chimney stack being finished. But this right here, um, a site is, is an area in the ground um, that you can find where there's deposits of either material culture or somebody once lived. A site normally um, has to be designated by a certain number of artifacts found in that area. So this right here, um, you see what are called features. So, and we're gonna talk about sort of the process of how we get it, like a site from looking like regular grass to looking like this, like how do we break into the earth and start doing the ac actual archeology? span We'll be talking about that in a minute, but what you see here and just, attention now as we're as we're looking you see these sort of boxes right it looks like a checkerboard of sorts that is um very intentional i'll talk about that in a moment but what you do is you take that sort of top layer of soil which is very much the soil that has been used to farm and sort of dead you know dead grass and leaves over the last however many hundreds of years and you get down to what's called subsoil this right here that you see um this is subsoil this is soil that has never been um, dug into or messed with. And once you sort of get down to the layer of subsoil, you'll start seeing stains in the soil. So if you see right here, um, there's a little line right there, there's a line carved out right there. Once you take subsoil, which is pretty much clay, and you break it, whether it's, you know, a worm can take, you know, make a hole in subsoil and change the soil. But if a human, for instance, a person digs a hole and then gets air in there, it actually changes the look of the dirt. So when it's filled back up again, it's going to be a different color than the soil around it because of the aeration and the different chemical sort of things that happen when air touches that subsoil. So what archaeologists can do is once they peel that whole top layer off systematically, right, in these little sort of checkerboard ways, you'll start to see patterns in the ground. And these are called features. And features are dug by um, either, well, you have to slice them in one way or another to be able to see the stratigraphy, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this, for instance, um, these things are everything from post holes to where there was a house at one point to trash pits. So you think now you take your garbage out, you put it in your can and the, the dump guys, you know, the trash guys come by and they take it to the dump. It's that easy. During the, God, all the way up, honestly, until really the 20th century, most people would dig a hole in their backyard and put all their garbage in it. That garbage is the, you know, that's the goodies. Like those, those are the goodies that archeologists wanna find because that's what, you know, we're able to look at the material culture of these past people to understand what they were eating, what they were drinking, how they were living. So those objects come out of these features and you're able to recreate a landscape by the stains in the ground. That was a very long-winded way of saying what a site is. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to dig though. I'm looking at that, like salivating at the idea of getting in there. I know, I miss it. I want to do it. We need to. There. But it's going to happen. Yes. Okay. So why is archaeology important? Well, archaeology helps us to appreciate and preserve our shared human heritage. It informs us about the past helps us understand where we came from and shows us how people lived, overcame challenges and developed the societies we have today. So um, anything you wanna share on that or add, <laughs> Kelly? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. So I want you to think for a moment about what's written about you. And right now in 2021, I would say we're definitely at a point where the written record pertaining to human beings, our history, our individual sort of experiences, everything from credit scores to our bank accounts, pretty much everybody in the Western world um, has, like in the United States, has some sort of written footprint of who they are, birth certificates, et cetera. Before the 20th century, um, and even the early part of the 20th century, you really didn't have a lot of these records. And so the vast majority of people did not have birth certificates, did not have any sort of written record um, sort of pertaining on, you know, to who they were. And they weren't, you know, most people also weren't literate. So they weren't writing their own stories. They weren't writing diaries. They weren't writing letters. And so when you have this massive absence of written material, it's really hard to figure out who these people were unless they were the, you know, the Thomas Jeffersons who wax poetic about himself his entire life, right? Like there are certain people out there that we have a very strong uh, sort of written footprint. The majority of the people though did not. So enslaved folks did not have necessarily a written imprint for the most part. They had certain sort of probates and things like that that talked about their value. Sometimes they were, you know, they had slave narratives, but those are very rare. 
women as well. Um, and anyone who was not elite, you know, probably wasn't literate and wasn't writing their own history. So to use archaeology, to use the garbage um, of these people, you're really able to sort of fill in that gap. So think about today, if you have, you know, your, your written fit footprint might be your age, your bank account, your worth, you know, um, maybe your children, etc. What you found, like, imagine if somebody went through your garbage, right? They would know a lot more about you than is than what's written down. They would know what you ate, right? They would know that you love Domino's pizza and you ate it seven times last week. They would know that you have an addiction to Pepsi, right? So it's these kinds of things um, that are found historically in archaeology that really help illustrate a broader idea, a broader understanding of these people. Exactly. And that kind of just leads us into why material culture is important. Um, well, for starters, as Kelly's mentioned, objects have meaning. And then secondly, sometimes these objects are the only clues we have to help us learn about the past. Absolutely. And that's, I think that does sort of bleed into what I just was talking about. Um, right here, we've got this wonderful bell um, that, you know, and I, I want to talk to you for a moment about things that survive in archaeological sites. So, for instance, something like this bell right here, which, you know, these date back to you know, probably a thousand plus years in West Africa. This right here, of course, is one that was probably made sometime in 2018. Um, but these bells were used um, throughout the African diaspora for music. Things that are metal typically um, do sort of hold uh, pretty well in the in the soil, unless the soil is really acidic and then it eats through it. Um, but for instance, if things are found in a well, so think back to my father digging in that privy, in that outhouse, if there was coin, if there were coins in there, um, they probably would have been somewhat preserved because they're under a layer that keeps all of the sort of chemistry um, balanced in a way that preserves these things. I've worked on sites where there have been wells where, I mean, literal, you know, helmets from the 17th century were getting pulled out, hoe blades that you could still see the sort of sharpened end on. As soon as they come out of the water, however, they start to deteriorate. So there's a, a lot of sensitivity too around preservation and sort of making sure you take care of these objects as soon as you get them out of the ground. All right, so we're going to do a little visualization. Um, and this is something that I like to do with students to help them understand the way material culture can be used to tell us about other people. Um, so think about your bedroom. Um, you may be sitting in it right now, so you don't have to imagine, but so imagine your bedroom. Uh, do you have pictures on the walls? Do you have posters? Uh, are your walls painted your favorite color? What about um, your closet? Do you have sports equipment in there? Do you have trophies or ribbons from things that um, you do or stuff that you collect? All of those things that we have, all of that material culture tells people about us. So imagine what someone would learn if they walked into your bedroom and uh, what that space is gonna tell them about you and what you like. My son's room, which is behind me, has a lot of stuff in it. And I can tell you right now, I grabbed this right here. <laughs> Definitely a Pokemon fan. <laughs> so, you know, little things like that. I think it's, you know, in these kinds of examples, you have to understand the material culture of the past to be able to interpret things from the past. So they didn't have Pokemon back in the 17th century and the 18th century, but, you know, finding like some, some bone cut, you know, dice or dominoes is going to be sort of equivalent to talking about playing games and sort of engaging in that kind of play. Exactly. All right, so archaeology is a science too, because I mean, we are on Science Saturday. <laughs> There's an apology <laughs> to it. <laughs> well, I think people forget this because it's so associated with history sometimes that mm -hmm. we we tend to lump it in with history versus science. But archaeology, our archaeology uses scientific principles and methods to guide its practices. So before beginning an excavation, archaeologists need pretty much three things, and that's to uh, have a reason to dig, have a plan, and then of course we have to have permission to dig. So those are all three very, <laughs> very that last one is very important to any looters out there. <laughs> you just can't go dig anywhere, okay? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so um, a little bit about the reason to dig. So what are some reasons to dig, Kelly? 
Oh my goodness. So the majority of the work that I did in California, for instance, was on construction sites. So there's a lot of laws that are in place, um, whether it's anything from NAGPRA, which is the Native American Repatriation Act, which protects Native American grave sites, um, all the way to Section 106, et cetera. There's all of these laws put into place um, that have really sort of taken over any kind of construction and preservation efforts over the last 50, 60 years. Um, and so, for instance, in California, a lot of the work that I was doing there was through cultural resource management. So they're going to build, you know, a 17 house complex in this field somewhere and they discover bodies that happened. Um, I worked at a site in Pleasanton, California, and it was actually probably more like 100 homes that were being placed on this beautiful sort of rolling hillside. It ended up being right on top of a Native American. American burial mound that had thousands of, in, of, of burials of Ohlone people. And basically the construction company had a choice. They can either stop construction and lose all their money or pay a lot of money and just get it fixed and dealt with. And that means having a representative from the Ohlone tribe on site, which happened um, when I was working there, making sure all of the rituals and things are done correctly as you open up those graves. And then of course, the uh, the hiring of a company to come out and excavate the bodies and take them and analyze them and then figure out what the tribe wants to do with them. Um, those particular laws are very strict, where for instance, right now there's a lot of stuff going through, um, I think Congress even, about um, African-American graves and trying to have similar protection for those. I would argue that everyone's grave needs to be respected and treated with you know, a different kind of sort of attention than just a regular site. So a lot of the work that I did in California was based on sort of the need because of construction, but some of the sites I've worked on, like the Presidio in San Francisco or Jamestown um, here in Virginia, it's all research-based. So there's money, there's an archaeology team, and they get to just sit there and dig for decades. And that's kind of what we're sitting on at Stratford Hall. Yeah. So basically, when we're excavating, it's either to answer questions that we have from a research standpoint or to resolve a particular issue, like you were saying, with construction. Mm -hmm. So we just don't go out and dig wherever we want, whenever we want. <laughs> Okay, so what about the location? So how do archaeologists find a location to dig? Well, we do that through research and identifying and surveying different sites. And well, how do we find out about those? Well, lots of times we hear about things through word of mouth. Somebody will say, hey, we found this in our backyard and um, or <laughs> <laughs> being contacted by a uh, company. Uh, Historical documentation. So lots of times we will look at um, things like maps and plots of sites to determine where people may have been living. Um, oral histories. So we can use those too uh, to help us determine where we might want to start digging. Um, satellite imagery, aerial photography, uh, geophysical prospecting, which is things like um, uh, taking radio images and um, like metal detecting sites and things like that. Uh, and then of course, surface survey, which means we just get out there and walk around <laughs> looking for <laughs> deposits of um, artifacts that might give us an idea where we wanna start digging. And it's funny, the, um, the word of mouth bit. So just a funny little tidbit on that. I can't even count the number of times that, you know, especially here in Virginia where, you know, they were going to be putting in some houses. And so we're out there in this like, you know, 700 acre of woods, 700 acres of woods, right? And we're doing this like 50, every 50 feet, we're taking a shovel test pit to try to find the site. And, you know, some dude rolls up on his four wheeler and is like, why are you looking over here? The site's over there. And it's like, okay, we're gonna do this systematically. Every single time that happened, the person that came up from the woods was absolutely correct. And so, you know, we do wanna eliminate the rest of the area, but word of mouth, I think is oftentimes not valued enough. Good point. Who knows the sites better than the people who live there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and walk through the woods their whole life. Exactly. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the preparation and excavation. Now, the def definition of excavation is a methodical uncovering, documenting, and recovery of material remains that have been buried under the ground. Before, so um, do you want to talk about the preparation? 
Yeah, no, yeah. definitely. So one of the ways, there's three phases of archaeology if you're a professional archaeologist. Um, phase one is what I just talked about a moment ago. That's literally getting a team of people and you use a compass and you're out in the woods and you mark off a grid and every like, however, it's sometimes it's 20 feet, sometimes, sometimes it's 50 feet, you dig little shovel test pits and to see if they're positive or negative. So they're holes about the size of a basketball and they go down until you hit subsoil. And that little sampling that you get, and imagine if you're looking at it from above, um, the little sampling, like a graph paper, think about it like that. Every, say, five you know, squares, you dig a little tiny hole. When you find things in those holes, you go back and you open up larger units. So that's phase two. Phase one is that big survey with shovel test bits where you're like, where's the positive areas? Where are the negative areas? Phase two is where you start to open up these um, these sort of grids right here. That's when you do test units. And that's typically done in different fashions. It's always pretty much a square. You take an area, you grid it off, um, you get your datum out there and you make sure everything is mapped correctly. And test units can be anywhere from, you know, two by two feet, typically larger. I've dug them as big as 10 by 10 feet on a larger site. And then you dig down until you get to the features and that's when you stop. Phase three is when all of this stuff is taken off. And phase three very much looks like that picture we saw in the beginning where those features were starting to get dug into. And that's that's the juicy stuff. That's when you really start to see exactly how that space was used and the stuff that was in the ground. I always think of the kind of the preparation and excavation almost like playing the game Battleship. So yeah, you, you hit one marker and you're not going to go, you know, across the board to, to find something else. You're going to go like beside you know, yeah. your marker yeah. in one direction or the other because you're almost guaranteed to, to hit something. In, That's in that a concept. perfect example, <laughs> Kelly. That's a perfect example. And for me, you know, I am a historian. I'm very passionate about history. I'm very creative. I have this artistic sort of thread through me, but I'm also a big like data nerd. So this kind of meticulous um, sort of methodology, I find incredibly exciting because it really solidifies the big sort of flowy ideas with hard science, which is quite fun. Oh. So now we're going to talk about stratigraphy, but first, um, how do archaeology or archaeological sites become buried? So the artifacts and structures that we uncover as archaeologists um, have typically been abandoned for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. And over time, these sites start to decay and deposits of soil start to build up um, and other debris naturally over time. Um, and that is how we end up with uh, strata or um, all these layers of soil over top of everything. And the study of that is called stratigraphy. So <laughs> there's the there's the little background information on stratigraphy, but Kelly, go for it. I absolutely, again, this is where my data nerd comes out big time. So if you remember that picture in the beginning of the talk where you know there was a feature, which was like, you know, a big blob and then it was cut in half. Imagine if you, if you made a cake, right? And the cake had like 17 different layers. Maybe the first layer of cake was like hazelnut. Then you put a chocolate layer. Then you put a strawberry layer, like et cetera, et cetera, right? And that cake had maybe like eight layers in it or something. And then you sort of frost it and then there's your beautiful cake. Working um, on like looking at stratigraphy is basically cutting that cake in half, removing like the layer by layer on one side and then looking at the profile of the other side to say, okay, there's, you know, hazelnut on the bottom. That was the first layer that went down. Then there's vanilla, then there's strawberry, et cetera. And those dates correlate with time, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay. So the law of superposition, this is something that we use to help us um, figure out these layers and date them and also help us determine artifacts. Uh, so there's your wonderful little picture there, and you can explain the law of superposition if you want, Kelly, or I can do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So, I mean, these, a lot of these features are literal trash pits, you know, they're, whether it's a well or anything else, the stuff at the bottom, just like in your own garbage can at home, you know, maybe this is from 1820 or your garbage is from Tuesday. Maybe this is from 1822 and your layer of garbage is from Wednesday. So the law of superposition um, is really what pretty much states that as long as it hasn't been disturbed, 
anything on the bottom. It's very logical. Anything on the bottom is the oldest and it gets no newer as you go up. And this is a way that you data site um, as well as, you know, sort of map it and sort of, if you also find something, say, and if you're looking at this right here, if you're finding something in stratum C, at the other half of it is, is in stratum E, you might think, oh, wow, maybe these things somehow were deposited at the same time. Or you had some rat come in there and pull something from stratum C and bring it down into stratum E. So that happens as well. Okay. I really want to dig now. I know. <laughs> Making Not me want heat. to as well. <laughs> Exactly. So tools of the trade. Um, there, uh, I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting when I did archaeology. Maybe something a little more glamorous. I expected to have a bullwhip or in a hat. I don't know. <laughs> um, but instead, I got a trowel and a toothbrush. <laughs> um, say, there are some examples of um, the different artifacts that we use. So you may notice a, a lot of different size trowels for scraping, uh, dental picks, toothbrushes, other types of brushes. Uh, so we're we're doing a lot of um, small very meticulous, careful work. Absolutely. We got a quick question from Adrian. Uh, Why would there be stratum D of sand and gravel in between? Go back to the other picture. That was yeah, just absolutely pulled off. So um, yeah, so sometimes, for instance, that's a really good question. So the question is, why would you have stratum D here? This is an example that Kelly pulled off the internet. So um, why would you have E full of all these, looks like very, you know, sort of indigenous sort of related objects. And then a stratum D has sand and gravel with nothing in it. And then up here, you've got, you know, a bullet and a shell button. Sometimes, just like we experienced at Stratford yesterday, huge storms come. And sometimes if this hole is dug in, the, you know, in the earth, it gets filled up with a bunch of stuff, you know, biological stuff. So sometimes those layers show up and, and withstand the test of time. So that's sometimes what happens. Nobody like literally went over there and dumped sand in. It was probably a environmental factor that went into that. Good Thanks question. for asking. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, and I think I, you know, people are really proud of their trowels when they get whittled down like that because it means they've been using them for a long time. I had my trowel that I lost sometime, must have been in like, I don't know, 2000, it was 21 years ago. I'm dating myself, but I had my trowel that I had for years and it got lost in a pile of back dirt and someday an archaeologist will find it and be like who lived here in the 2000s some lady with a trowel so yeah <laughs> and dental picks are and dental tools are really important especially when you're excavating um things like <clears throat> excuse me burials and skeletal remains okay so um another aspect of archaeology is screening. So we just don't take all the dirt that we pull out of these sites and uh, toss it. We have to screen it for small artifacts. And um, this is an extremely important part of the process. Um, yeah, screen, screen it by layer too. So as I said, if you think about that layer cake and you're cutting into half of it, you're pulling off that first layer first until you see the change of soil or this change of cake in that next layer. You, you basically take all of that um, that layer that you pull off and screen it separately so you make sure you keep the objects um, in proper context because once they're out of context, they lose a lot of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, these screens right here are very standard in archaeology. They're about a quarter of an inch thick, thick mesh. Um, there are like finer screens um, for water screening, which is really fun, um, where you actually spray, it's faster too. You spray um, a hose through and it pushes through all of the dirt and then all the objects, all the artifacts stay on top. And that's really good for smaller things like beads, etc. Okay, so collecting data, which is something we do throughout the entire process. Um, when we're at archaeological sites um, excavating, we take detailed notes, um, we draw maps, we take photographs, and those are just a few of the things that, that we do. Um, to make sure that we keep the context as Kelly was talking about. Now, um, definition for context is the position and association of an artifact, feature, or archaeological find in space and time. Uh, and we documenting where our artifacts are found and what was around them allows archaeologists to interpret them and understand their meaning better. So. 
And if you see, this is a very traditional chair in archaeology. It's a bucket turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and that is pretty much what you sit on when you eat your sandwich that's been sitting out in your bag for four hours in the heat and drinking your Gatorade, trying not to pass out. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, the, the first archaeology site that I, I dug at, we were underneath a walnut tree, so I kept getting pelted with uh, walnuts. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, all right, so lab work. Now, yeah. Kelly, I'm going to... Yeah, I'll take, I'll take this one. So my first job um, working in archaeology was at Jamestown Rediscovery. And I mean, what a great place to start. And this was before, I mean, this was right after they discovered Jamestown, right after Bill Kelso made that discovery in the 90s. Um, I was working in what then was a trailer because we didn't have a nice archaearium or, I mean, it was, you know, Jamestown was very rough and tumble back in the mid nineties. And my job was to take all of the bags, all the artifacts that were screened that you saw, like in the last picture and wash them in the lab. So you have to keep them, of course, in context. You would take one bag that was say from, you know, layer C um, and the unit and everything is marked on there. You would take all that information that was written on the bag, transfer it onto something else um, that you would put into a tray and you literally take a toothbrush old school style and some water and you get all the dirt off um, at that point you let it dry and then you start to catalog it mark it um, I can't tell you the number of ceramic shards that I had to sit there with a tiny little fountain pen and write the exact context you know unit three you know whatever layer a on um, that's something that I actually really enjoyed doing for years of my life and it's a really wonderful way to really touch the actual stuff. So when you're in the field, you know, it's all about making sure everything stays in context, getting the stuff out, you know, correctly. When you're in the lab, you can take some more time with it. And I'm excited about Stratford because the lab work has never been done. So we've got 40 plus years of archaeology that was done with pretty much very little uh, lab work. Um, you know, performed. And so this, to me, is one of the most fun parts of digging, especially as I get older and don't want to go out in the blazing sun, sitting in a lab with a toothbrush and some pens, um, really sort of taking these things and cleaning them up is one of the most exciting parts, I think. It's kind of when you get to see everything because, you know, you'll have multiple people working on on a, a unit, so you don't always see what everybody pulls out. So it's, yep. you know, and sometimes you don't realize what it is until you clean it up. And one of those objects I'll show you in a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And interpretation. This might be between exca excavating and um, the interpretation might be my favorite part. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. And, you know, you're the manager of interpretation. So that also makes sense. So interpretation is when you take all those things, they've been cleaned, they've been kept in context, they are ready to tell stories. And that's when you take the objects, the material culture and create narratives out of them. And that um, this is when you see them in magazines, when you see articles written about them, this is when you see them in museums. And um, just a shout out to everybody to let you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll be opening up our new exhibit, which is archeology span heavy. So definitely come out and check it out. So I think we're going to go now into our some of our favorite objects. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's the next part. Here we go. Oh well. Real quick. How how do we use archaeology at Stratford Hall? And I feel like we've probably touched on this, but I think so. Yeah. And this again is the oval site. So all the things that I just told you, everything from what Kelly said about the battleship thing, all the way to the sort of graph paper to the features. Um, imagine these as little cakes, and you're just sort of carving down into the ground to see what they look like. Um, we use these objects, and we're going to talk about some of the objects that came from this particular site, the oval site, which again was the temporary housing area for the first enslaved Africans at Stratford. Um, we're going to show you some of the objects that were excavated out of here that were washed by some of my students um, that really looked like nothing until we hit them with a toothbrush. Okay. Uh. <laughs> um, this right here is definitely one of my favorite objects. This is a quartz bead that was found on the site. These quartz beads, and this is probably the size of like, you know, a marble, like a regular size, you know, about that big around. And this right here um, was found at that site in the ground, and it was very likely made in West Africa. Do you want to go to the next slide? Do we have the picture of the? Yes. 
All right, so here's a picture right here of a woman from, um, I think, Angola. So not exactly Ghana, but a lot of the West Africans um, during the period of the transatlantic slave trade, the women would wear waist beads um, or beads generally. And when you find a bead, um, first of all, it's hard to find because they're small and sometimes they slip through the screen. But when you find a bead, it's a very personal object. And I think it can really help tell the story of someone like one of the women who were enslaved and brought over to Stratford in 1738 must have been wearing this waist bead, either or this bead either on her waist or around her neck and was probably very much cherished. Um, at some point that bead fell off and ended up in the ground and we excavated it and were able to tell the story of women through their material culture through this object. All right. Uh, okay, this right here. Um, some of you have heard me talk about this as well, and you're like, oh, this thing again. But I find this thing to be fascinating. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, um, some of the enslaved Africans that were brought to Stratford in 1738 came from Senegambia. So Sen that's Sen Senegal or Gambia. It's sort of on the um, western, sort of more north part of West Africa. That area had been colonized by uh, Muslims far before the slave trade started. And so a lot of the um, indigenous Africans there were uh, practiced Islam. You also have a lot of trade coming in from the north, places like, you know, uh, Tunisia, etc., Morocco coming down into that area. This right here um, was found at the Oval site, and it looked like, I won't say a Cheeto, but it looked like a big blob of dirt. Um, and one of my students was doing lab work for me. He's actually from Senegal. And it was so cool when this happened because you know, he knew that some of the objects might have been from where, you know, where he grew up and he was washing this particular artifact. And he said, Kelly, what is it? No, Dr. Dietz, you know, what is this thing? Is this plastic? And I was like, there's no way there's a plastic anything on a, it was on one of the deeper layers too. It wasn't like it was up top where someone could have dropped it in the 1950s or something. It was one of the, the deeper layers, the lower layer, layers, the earliest layers. And we cleaned it up and it is actually a tortoise shell and sterling silver Pipe. So either a mouthpiece um, to a hookah pipe or some other sort of pipe that you would smoke like this. And this kind of smoking utensil was very common in Northwest Africa during the period of enslavement and even now. So this is one of those things that the lab work really sort of rendered this fantastic story out of this. Let me make sure the questions are related to that. Okay. 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 This one now, is chills. I love this one too. This right here um, was not found at the Ulva site. This was actually found in the walls. And if you saw my talk a couple of weeks ago on things hidden in the walls, um, this was sort of the the gem, if you will, of some of the objects that were pulled out of the wall over the last 90 years of restoration efforts in the great house and the mansion. This right here is a quartz crystal. Um, it's not quartz, I'm sorry, it's calcite, excuse me there. Um, it's a calcite crystal with an X marked on both the front and the back, and it was found in the northeast windowsill, deep inside the windowsill, sometime in the mid 20th century, by some construction guy that was in there fixing the windowsill and had to take all the panes off and put them back on. And he found it deep in the windowsill. So it definitely was placed when the house was constructed in the 1730s or 40s. Um, this right here was put into a an envelope um, and the envelope said on it, um, found in the wall and they called it flint. First of all, it's not flint. Second of all, it is, you know, probably calcite. And moreover, the X marks were very intentional. This right here is a very clear example, excuse me, a very clear example of a uh, West African religious practice of conjuring that you found in the diaspora. So a lot of West African cultures and religions believed that by marking of the X, the crossroads, think of Robert jo Johnson, you know, selling his soul to the devil at the crossroads all the way up. I mean, that was like what in the 1930s or something. There's still references to the crossroad throughout African diaspora culture and religion. The crossroads were, um, literally carved onto objects, especially organic objects, things like crystals, to conjure the ancestors, to conjure the spirit, to protect those who needed it. So some enslaved person 
somehow got their hands on a on a on this calcite crystal that did not come locally. This is not found naturally in the geology of the northern neck. Got their hands on this, I'm not sure where, carved X's in it and literally placed it intentionally in one of the north walls of the Great Hall, which is completely in line with hoodoo practices throughout the southern United States and actually the northern United States as well. So this object, while not found in the ground, um, is in some ways, I think, just as cool as anything else, if not cooler. And it was hidden in a way um, for someone like my team and I, right? All of us to be like, wait a second, that's not Flint and there's an X on it. So yeah, this thing kicks butt for lack of a better phrase, amazing. You can't not talk about it. Yeah, you can't not talk about it. There we go. Yes, and these right here um, date, so these are uh, projectile points that were found, I don't even know where, I think there's an envelope, they were found around the site over the years, and these date um, to the woodland era, which I'm blanking on the date right now, but, you know, pre-contact um, of Europeans, and a lot of these are found you know, throughout the United States. And they're really important in sort of looking at the ways in which indigenous cultures, um, you know, hunted, ate, survived, and had, you know, skill sets to build and sort of, you know, chip out these really important tools to be able to feed their family and survive. And these are in the exhibit as well with definite um, dates on them, which I don't have at my fingertips. And I'm sorry, I can grab it if you need to. All right. And this is a handful of artifacts <laughs> that was found at Stratford. So before we ended, I wanted to sort of show you, um, you know, there's the screen that you see behind this person's hands. This is what objects look like once you kick all the dirt off of them. And you see everything here from pipe shards that are European as well as locally made, possibly ones carved by Africans to beads. And these objects, um, you can imagine how fun it is to open up a bag. So this would go from this person's hand into a bag. And once you get these in the lab, we took a toothbrush to them and they look brand new. So just wanted to end with this very sort of unglamorous picture of some of the artifacts in the middle part of the analysis, the sort of, you know, right between the liminal space, right between the excavation and the analysis and interpretation. And, and I think last but not least, <laughs> questions. Yeah. yeah. Kelly. All right, now it's time for questions. Thanks. Okay. All right, we already have them go. Um, James wrote early on in the talk, have either of you participated in any mudlarking digs, either along the Potomac or along the tidal rivers? I was introduced to this by my wife's cousin who lives south of London in the UK. We waited for low tide, oh cool, we waited for low tide on the Thames and scoured the banks. Within 15 minutes, we found several clay pipe stems, each probably at least 200 years old. Other more prominent artifacts have been found there, of course, coins, weapons, etc. So cool. Is this activity allowed or undertaken on the grounds of Stratford Hall? Um, we do have paleo, um, paleontology trips that you could probably, when the tides are low, probably end up picking up a pipe stem, as you know, along with a megalodon tooth, if you're interested. Um, we do not promote this kind of um, sort of I don't know, gathering of things. I would like it to be more formal just because the stuff on site belongs to Stratford and we wanna be able to take, so I understand sort of how cool that would be and it's totally disturbed once it's in there. So I totally get that like, okay, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna find some pipe stems and it's like in the mud and whatever. Um, it's very important, however, to keep track of all those things. And if something really significant is found, it's important to be able to use that to interpret the site. So we don't allow it, but I don't know, I think it'd be fun maybe to have, you know, in addition to maybe the paleo trips to have something like that one day where we just go out there and we see what we find. And then everything else, um, everything that's found can come into the lab and then be interpreted. So thank you for that question, James. Let's see here. All right, what type of string were the beads strung with? Great question, Doreen. So a lot of times, um, you know, anything from different threads. Um, I'm not sure exactly the kinds of threads that they would have been using in West Africa during that period, but they had a very vibrant um, textile industry. So I think that that would, been, would have been a very easy thing to, to make, um, but also things like sinew, which is literally um, string made out of um, animals like deer sinew. So that was very common, I know, um, amongst the native populations and communities here in the United States, um, but I'm not sure exactly, but it's a great question. I'm gonna have to figure that out. Thank you, Doreen. 
Barbara, when you visit Stratford Hall, can you see an excavation site? How often does excavation occur? So great question. Um, right now, we um, are not necessarily having open digs. Um, again, I had mentioned earlier that we have a serious backlog of lab work that needs to be done. Um, and ethically, I think it's important to sort of get a handle on that before we dig more. Um, however, um, we have just recently completed an archaeological study on the east steps of the house. So so the mansion itself uh, was built in 1738 and the Lees during different generations decided to do different things to it, you know, change the steps, move the walls around. As part of um, an effort to figure out what those original steps looked like, they removed the steps um, and they've done archaeology to sort of help figure out what the kind of footings in the ground would say, those features in the ground would say about what the steps originally looked like. So. That just closed up. Um, that part of the site is still somewhat open, but you can't really see anything, especially with the rain. It just kind of looks messy. But, you know, I definitely have plans for archaeology at Stratford and hope that we can really formalize our program there in the years to come. So thank you for asking. Let's see here. George says, are any of the pipes in the collections have the markers, are the marks like our tippet? Oh my goodness. We have our pipe collection at Stratford is amazing. So we've got pipes from, of course, you know, the Netherlands, um, England, absolutely. We've got tons of locally made pipes and a lot of them have maker's marks, as you mentioned, George. So uh, makers of pipes, whether it was someone local, like um, I think his name was Robert Cotton, or somebody like, you know, Tippett or others would literally have their own little stamp that they would put on the bottom of the, like if a pipe looked like, I think I have a pipe around here somewhere, if a pipe looked like this, and here's the bowl, the stamp would normally be on the bowl part or underneath, and oh my goodness, at Jamestown when I was there, I spent a good, I don't know, a few months drawing a bunch of the maker's marks. Um, so yeah, George, if you're interested in pipes, you should definitely come see our collection. It's fantastic. Thank you for asking. Um, can you find out how old the arrowheads are? Yes, I found one in my backyard. I actually have an expert that I've been working with because um, that is not my area of expertise. And so I've got a guy named Christopher in Richmond, who I think he works for the state, but he is, you know, he knows about projectile points and he dated mine like that. And I apologize for not having the exact um, date there. There's also a really good website too. So anonymous attendee who asked that question, email me at kdeets at stratfordhall.org and I will send you the website website that has literally this phenomenal sort of um, uh, sort of type collection where they have the shape and the, you know, the length and the measurements and the materials that can probably help you narrow that down. Doreen asks, what, what are other sites besides Stratford that are being excavated in the Northern Neck? Excellent question. And I don't know the answer to that, actually. Do you know, Kelly? Um, you know, I'm not really sure if what other historic sites are running archaeology right now? Um, yeah. That are local. Huh. I mean, I know we have, of course, Minokin's nearby, George Washington's birthplace, um, but I, I don't know if there's been, I know there's been archaeology done at these places, right, you know, currently time, right but now. But I don't think actively, like, an open. Yeah, exactly. Um, let me see here. Some questions in the chat, so I just want to make sure I don't miss those. Yes. Um, Adrian asks, this is my favorite. Yay! It's my favorite too. Um, I did see your talk. I wanted to ask about this. Is archaeology only items dug out of the ground or things found um, in elsewhere? So I think I answered that pretty much. Yeah, archaeology is typically things that were thrown away um, in the ground, but, you know, artifacts are everywhere. So that's, you know, you can even think of it as some people in England right now are calling, um, what are they calling it? It's like architectural archaeology or something when you're literally finding things in the walls of, of built buildings. And so, you know, I'm, I think that's kind of fair. We're using the same kind of methods. So I don't know. It's just not getting dirty. But thank you for asking that. Um, back to the stratum layers. How do you know to keep digging once you've hit layer? Okay, so as you're digging down, um, you're pretty much, by the time you get to the, the, the stage where you know where the features are, you're going to know exactly what the subsoil looks like. In places like where I live or where Monticello is, that subsoil is this like thick red clay that stains everything. Um, everything else around it is, you know, darker or softer, etc. So you really have to understand 
um, what color the soil is, the textures of it, etc. to know when you hit it. So say you come down, say you're digging up some stuff and it's got some pretty cool artifacts in it and then all of a sudden you see a layer of sand and you're like, okay, things are changing here. You're going to excavate that out and then if underneath of that looks like subsoil, you stop. But if underneath it is some sort of like dark brown sandy loam with like, you know, shards sticking out of it, you keep digging and I hope that answers your question. We also have, what is it, the Munsell tests that we do? Yeah, to determine Munsell different, chart. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we take coding. soil samples, and we document that, like, every day. We're like, the soil looked like this today when we, yeah. so. Every single layer is marked by the Munsell color, etc. And there's also things, too, some people really like doing the um, the boring, where they'll take, like, a, you know, they'll just, like, cut the core out, and they'll see exactly what the stratigraphy looks like. Um, you know, that's, I'm not a huge, I mean, it's fine. I'm not a huge fan of that. I'd rather just dig it all up, but it's also really hard to get those things in the, in the ground. Anyways, any more questions from any of you? This has been fun. And what I would love to do is as we start working with the, the artifacts that are, you know, waiting to be washed and processed, you know, as we find cool things, I think we need to have more of these Science Saturdays based on our archaeological findings, because as I said with that one pipe from North Africa, you know, we're going to be finding stuff that is just sitting there waiting to be, you know, part of our story we're telling or the stories that we're telling at Stratford. Maybe we could even do a day in the lab and do different, Ooh. Uh, like cleaning and, and, labeling and yeah. absolutely and I would love also to have a volunteer program where people come and wash artifacts because that is fun fantastic awesome well I don't see any more questions last chance last call for questions here we had a full house right up until almost the end of the hour which is exciting um, I had a blast today talking archaeology with you, Kelly, and showing Aww. you all, all of our fun stuff that we have at Stratford. I highly recommend that you all come out. Oh, wait, there's a question. Hold on. This has been fascinating, Becky. Yay! Would you consider a day in the lab for my U.S. History 1 students? Absolutely. We can make that happen. So reach out to us, Becky, um, and we can arrange that for sure. So yeah, please, all of you come to Stratford. Um, you know, there's only, I think, 14 of you right now um, in this in this Zoom. So if you want to hit me up, um, we can arrange a special tour or something. But please keep zooming in. Uh, support us in any way that you can, whether it's through attendance of one of our programs or becoming a friend of Stratford member, which you can do on site or coming to site and seeing our amazing history that we have that we're offering now. Anything else you want to add, Kelly, before we wrap this up? Nope, just thank you. This has been a lot of fun and I can't wait to hear from some of you guys. So awesome. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Good, you're welcome. Goodbye, everyone. And we will see you in a month. Bachman will be back talking about probably dinosaurs. <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye.